what is it about Zoom X foam that just makes this shoe so good? I mean, at the end of the day, it's some upper materials, a bit of rubber and some foam. Is that the special thing about this shoe that makes it the one everybody goes for? And is Zoom X foam always the same between Nike shoes? Let's discuss. Welcome back to the channel guys. If it's your first time here, make sure you help us out by hitting that subscribe button and also clicking the bell below for notifications when we launch those new videos for you. Also give us a super thanks and hit that like button. It really helps us out. Thanking you Tar. Gonna delve into the manufacturing process a little bit and see if we can figure out why Zoom X foam is just so good. What is it about this TPE or thermoplastic elastomere that just seems to work so well in a running shoe scenario. We can't get away from the fact that some of these super shoes that use p based foams are very expensive. Why is there such a high cost to some of these shoes? Is it down to the manufacturing? I have uncovered some interesting nuggets of information that do surround p foam. Quite a lot of this information is actually from a source that was from 2013. It's not like this stuff's just suddenly appeared. It's been around for quite a while. We know that PVAX based footwear has taken over the whole running shoe game. It pops up in a variety of different top line models. Its properties are that it's very lightweight, you've got incredible absorption and dampening properties too. And it's also very, very flexible, which tends to mean that it's quite forgiving underfoot. You can also utilize it for lots of different things. I think that's down to the cellular structure of the foam itself, but it does appear when they're manufacturing it, there are quite a few disadvantages. I think one of the big issues that some people have found trying to utilize this foam, certainly in this type of scenario, is that while they're creating the foam itself, it does tend to shrink. So I think it's quite a time consuming process. Maybe they've been able to speed that up over time. Now they've perfected the use of this type of foam. I think the melting temperature of this type of foam as well is quite different. So when they're manufacturing it, it's a lot more difficult to do than a TPU based foam. Thermoplastic polyurethane. I think that's foams like Boost and things like that. They are TPU. I think experimentation has been rife over TPU based foams over the years, but I think the use of TPE foams was far less common until obviously Nike decided to try using it. I think Nike's domination in this area has forced the hand of other shoe manufacturers. I think when they actually create the foam, it's called thermoforming. All the information I've found, it appears that a temperature upwards of 180 degrees C is needed to mold this type of foam. And there's several different development grades of PBAX as well, not all the same. I think you can produce a foam, but you can also produce more like a very hard plastic, which still has some of the properties. One version of the foam is more breathable and very waterproof. It will have some sort of impermeable properties to it. Bio-based versions of PBAX can also be utilized. I think they use castor oil. I think that's actually the type of foam that appears on the bottom of the recent tree flyer from Allbirds. And there's even a variant of PBAX that is anti-static as well, because you've got to worry about that when you're running. It's very important. Higher density applications of PBAX have been used as structural pieces to help stabilize areas of shoes. Perhaps like some of the stuff we've seen used in the Mizuno offerings. You often see those wave plates, don't you, in the rear of the shoe. I think that's there to provide a bit of stability to those softer foams. I think the big benefit with PBAX foams is the lightness. They're just so much lighter when compared to EVA based foams. You've got a much lower density foam here with faster recovery properties to it but it still performs in a similar way in terms of hardness and tear resistance to EVA. So you've got a lighter, but also very durable foam, which is really going to be of use within a running shoe scenario. I think one area that people miss is the use of PBAX within insoles of shoes. These have cropped up in a few Nike shoes over the last couple of years. I think namely the Tempo Next Percent did use a crushed PBAX based insole. Just lowers the weight a little bit. I think between a standard insole and a PBAX based one, you might have about four or five grams difference, but every little helps, right? One big area that PBAC seems to have a big advantage over EVA foams is when the temperature drops below a certain point. I think we're looking at temperatures of around about what it's like in the UK or perhaps even lower, perhaps sub-zero. It does appear that PBAC's foams 
do retain that cushion that you would want even in much lower temperatures. It never gets above about 25 degrees here in the UK. I don't ever recall that there's been a major difference in terms of the Zoom X foam within any Vaporfly shoes that I've tried out when it's been very cold or very warm. It just all seem to be pretty much consistent. So those are some of the key advantages to using that PBAX based Zoom X foam in the Nike shoes. One thing strikes me though, across the different models, the Zoom X foam seems to be different. Nobody can tell me that the foam used here in the Vaporfly Next% Percent 2 is the same as the foam that's in the Nike Streetfly. Just even in hand, they feel really, really different. So are Nike using two different formulas of ZoomX across their different ZoomX shoes? I asked the viewers of the channel via the community section at around about 7 p.m., which is seven hours after I launched the poll, about 317 people had voted and 67% believe that there were different versions of ZoomX being used across the Nike running shoe lineup. Two thirds of people think that there are two versions of ZoomX. I think perhaps there's one type in the Alpha Fly and the Vapor Fly series, and then maybe another that's used in the Street Fly and the Invincible Run. Not sure about the Vomero 16, you can't really see it. It's certainly there. I'd suggest it's perhaps a more along the lines of the one that's in the Street Fly. I think that could be further extended when the Nike Zoom X Zigama drops very soon. It's the new trail shoe. And maybe the Zoom Fly 5 as well may feature something that's similar to the Vomero 16. One interesting comment from a man whose feet and mind I trust very much is Tim Gross. He's noted differences in the softness in different pairs of the Vaporfly Next% Percent 1. And some large weight variations as well, up to 15 grams. I mean, that's pretty considerable, really. He's got 12 different shoes featuring ZoomX, so I think he's very qualified to comment here. Are oh, some of the differences here down to the utilization of the ZoomX foam within certain shoes. I know the Dragonfly track spike to me certainly feels a little bit more like the ZoomX that's in the Vaporfly Next Percent. Perhaps it's all just a placebo thing and Nike aren't really tinkering with the formula at all. To me, the Streetfly and the Invincible Run have got a far more sort of rubbery texture to the foam. Feels like it's almost got a coating on the outside of it. And the Vaporfly Next Percent ZoomX feels a little bit more hollow and brittle. They're all great shoes, but the foam feels massively different to me, at least in my experiences, and certainly underfoot and between the fingers. What say you, good people? Has ZoomX really set the pace? Does it work for you, or does it just feel like an unstable mess? Let me know your thoughts and opinions down in the comments. A quick musical interlude for you. Today I had to try to calm down my son when he was eating his dinner, and the only way to do it was with some Nick Drake. The fabulous album Made to Love Magic features a load of alternative versions of some of his best tracks. I really love the first one, Rider on the Wheel. It has this really rhythmic, very woody quality to the guitar playing. Nick Drake had a wonderful guitar playing touch. Just so sad that more people didn't get to hear it when he was here. Magic is a fantastic track that only really happened due to technological innovation. They managed to get a vocal take of his and then apply the actual scored orchestration behind the vocal take. Must have been pretty difficult to do at the time. I think this was released back in 2004, so they didn't have the technology they certainly have now, but it does sound fantastic. This album does give you a fantastic insight into how Nick Drake did construct some of his songs, and these alternate takes just sort of pad out the Nick Drake legend a little bit more. Go and check it out, guys. This one's from Nick Drake. It's called Made to Love Magic. Magic. A little bit of magic. That's what Wizbit would say. Thanks for tuning in, guys. It's always appreciated. If you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button and click the bell below for notifications. But also give this video a thumbs up, like, and share it with your running buddies. My name's Ed Bud, and I'll be seeing you. Ooh, what we got here? Let me have a look. Ooh, Cumulus 24 from ASICS. Very light this one in hand with the Flight Foam Blast Mitzel. Keen to test this one out. Keep your eyes peeled for a review very soon.